This is Senate Finance. Okay, it's things are still loading slowly. I don't, thought we'd fix that problem, but it's not. Okay, so today we're going to go back and uh, take a look at S. 212 in this is income based education funding and um, first on the agenda if I get this notice out of the way is Stephanie Yu um, from deputy director of public assets so Stephanie the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thanks for having me again. Um, so I'm Stephanie Yu, the Deputy Director of Public Assets Institute, and um, just have a, a couple points I think I want to make. When I so when I came in a couple of weeks ago to talk about pupil waiting and and cost equity payments, um, I mentioned that this month marks the 25th anniversary of the Brigham decision, which led to the transformation of our school funding system. Yes. So we currently have these two parallel systems for how Vermont residents pay their school taxes, one based on household income and one based on property value. And, and earlier in that history, in 1994, the House actually passed a fully income-based school funding system for residents that was rejected by the Senate. But even before that, uh, we've had some form of income adjustments. So in 1970, we began a rebate program for older Vermonters with fixed incomes and rising property values. And in 1973, we expanded that program to low-income Vermonters. And then of course, Act 60 in 1997 greatly expanded it, more than tripling the number of taxpayers who are paying their school taxes based on income. So that now most Vermonters pay some or all of their school taxes based on income. So I think what you're talking about is really sort of the next step in the evolution of our school funding system that began 50 years ago. And from our, from our perspective, moving to income-based school taxes makes sense because it's fair. It means that all Vermont residents pay on the same basis and high-income Vermonters would contribute at at least the same rate as low and middle-income Vermonters. It's also a lot simpler. It would eliminate a lot of what makes the system complicated now, the common level of appraisal, the lag in the property tax adjustment, the two rates, the two yields, and it would allow taxpayers, many taxpayers, uh, to spread out their school taxes over the year rather than being faced with one big bill, one or two big bills um, a couple times a year. So the two, you know, the way we see the, the two big problems with this system now are that it's complicated and regressive. Trying to force a property tax to act like an income tax means that we're adding a lot of, a lot of tweaks and making it more complicated, both for voters to follow and for local and state government to administer. One of the strengths of the school funding system, I think, is the direct democracy decision-making system, which means that voters in each community are deciding each year how much to spend on their schools. So that means that the tax consequences of their decision should be easy to, to, under, to understand, but right now they really aren't. And the regressivity of the system is an equity issue. People with the highest incomes are paying the lowest share of their income in school taxes. Low and middle income people are spending an average of about 2.6% of their income. Those making a million or more are paying less than a fifth of that, about a half a percent. So income-based school taxes would go a long way towards solving both of these problems. And the Tax Structure Commission took up this question, as I'm sure you've seen, um, about how to improve the system and concluded that moving all residents to income-based school taxes would be the fairest system. I think, and, and I think they started from the premise that, and, and Commissioner Brighton can speak more to this, but started from the premise that, that one system was better than this hybrid system, that moving to all one or all the other made sense. And they really wanted to understand which one was the better idea, the property, a property-based system or an income-based system. And again, I think what we have now started as a property tax and then we sort of layered income sensitivity on top of it, which made it messier and messier. But it's an essentially, essentially an income-based adjustment so that people can afford their school taxes. And I think one of, the, one of the most important things that the commission dug into, the findings that they had, was that home value is not a good measure of ability to pay. At the low end, what you have is that property values might exceed a family's net worth because they owe a lot on their mortgage and they have few other assets. And then at the high end, the primary residence is a small slice of their total net worth. So in neither case is property value a good measure of their ability to pay. And ultimately, you're paying your taxes out of your income and not your property. That's sort of our, our sort of um, high, high level um, conceptual sort of ideas about why it makes sense to move to income-based taxes. But I think there's also some process stuff in this bill that's really important. 
Um, the Education Fund Advisory Committee is a good idea. I think a lot of the issues that create confusion and frustration with the school funding system, both for policymakers and for uh, voters, are kind of the result of a lack of coordinated system management. As you are all too well aware after the last few weeks, uh, school finance has many moving parts that affect the taxes that Vermonters pay in each school district. And so changing one part of the system is gonna affect the other parts. So it's helpful to have that technical analysis of the education fund performed outside of the political process, gives you the information and analysis you need to make timely decisions. And, and I think across the board, it increases trust in the system, both again, among the information that, that legislators are getting, but also for voters. And, and it allows for a more long-term view of the fund rather than sort of year-to-year -year updates and focusing on you know, any given year's ed fund outlook. And I think it would make it easier for the legislature to go back to setting the yield in January, which would also make things clearer and easier for school districts as they're finalizing their budgets and for voters to decide on them. So uh, you know, we, I think we have this, this solid education funding system with this baseline level of, of statewide equity, both for students and taxpayers, and we balance it with local control over school budgets. It's definitely complicated. It can be made simpler. Um, but it is a lot more equitable than those of other states. And I think this is another step in sort of improving that equity. There's a lot of overlap in these two issues in, in how you're in, in both the pupil weighting and cost equity discussion and the income-based school taxes because of how they both impact students and voters. There's a close relationship, right, between what, what towns pay, what voters pay, and what they get out of the system. That being said, um, I think a useful way to think about this is that income-based taxes are correcting a, a current unfairness in who pays instead of higher income Vermonters paying a smaller share than lower middle incomes, everyone would pay at least the same. But then the pupil weighting and cost equity discussion is really about where the money goes, making sure all kids have the, the, the resources that they need through whatever mechanism um, you land on. But, but again, those two things are tied cl closely together in our system, but that is sort of the two aspects of the system I think that you're looking at. So I think they're both important improvements and you know it, it would be great if we could make progress on, on both of them this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have any backup data for that you could share with the committee? So we did put together a, a, a a lot of analysis in terms of sort of the, the regressivity of the system in terms of the sort of steps you need to go through. I'm happy to share handouts that we presented. Yeah, that, would, that would be helpful. And the task force. Mm -hmm. All right, the other question I have, my concern is right now, the income tax is the only source that the general fund has to go to. So if we, essentially do away with the property tax and pay for schools on the income tax. Do you have any research as to what is the total taxing capacity? If we do this, unless we want to raise taxes on, you know, income for all Vermonters, what's, what's the excess taxing capacity at that top end that we're all going after and how much of it would this proposal use up? So I think there's a couple of different questions in there that I can Probably. that I can kind of split out if you don't mind. So the first nope. one is what is what's the tax capacity at the top end? Yep. And you know the way that we think about this is so personal income in the state, total personal income grows pretty much every year, right? This is sort of another big measure of mm -hmm. um, big sort of macroeconomic measure of what's happening. And so we're at, I think, around 35, 36 billion. Now, some of that growth in the last year had to do with some of the COVID relief transfer money and that kind of thing. But even during the Great Recession, even during economic downturns, what we saw is that total pot keep growing, right? And, and so when we think about that, so right now we collect um, around 11, 12, 13% of total personal income in state taxes, state and local taxes. So for every percentage point, it's about give or take three hundred million dollars, right? So, so I think the question is, you know, at various points, sort of in the state's history, we've collected a larger share of that total personal income. So if we went to 14, 15 percent of that total personal income, 
you know, like again, for each percentage point, somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 to 400 million dollars. So, so I think that the question is less about what's the excess capacity at the top and more about how that collection is distributed sort of overall. So I think the capacity is there, it keeps growing, right? Personal income keeps growing, the capacity is there. So an, again, another percentage point buys you a, a fair amount and you're still talking about 14, 15% of total personal income. But the distribution of it, which is sort of what this proposal gets to, I think is the key part. Um, you know, right now, higher income Vermonters are paying a lower share than lower middle income. Property, but yeah. higher income Vermonters are paying a much larger share of the income tax. Is it because they have a larger share? Of the is income. it something like four percent pay fifty percent of the total income revenue, or maybe it's ten percent pay fifty percent of the total? So they're paying a higher percentage in income, and we're the second most graduated, you know, progressive tax system. So I'm just wondering how those balance out. Right. And I think I think um, Commissioner Brighton is going to get into some of the, okay. the detailed analysis of some of this stuff. But I will say that it's because they have a larger share of the income that that total personal income is obviously not e evenly distributed per capita. Right. A lot of it is concentrated at the top. And so the yeah. total share of income that that group has what is collected it reflects the share of their income that they have, not the share of taxpayers that are in that group. But the but the other point, I think I, I think the other part of your question that maybe I didn't get get to was um, this question of sort of the mix of revenue in the state. And I'm I'm happy to show I we presented in the task force, you know, moving to income based school taxes only shifts a small share of the ed fund to from a property base to an income base, you know, relatively speaking, we're in the 150, 200 million dollar range of a, you know, 1.5, 1.8 billion dollar fund. So overall, the mix of state revenues doesn't change that significantly. I can pull up the exact numbers, um, but it was, I think, it went from I don't know, 28 percent to 30. 1% somewhere in that ballpark. You know, it's not a huge difference in terms of the overall mix of revenue in the state and what the base is for those types of for the revenue. Has any other state done away with the property tax and gone all the income? Well, there's still property taxes. Um, first of all, a lot of other states don't have a statewide property tax. They're property taxes. We're local. the only one that does. Right. So, so, um, so we'd still have local property taxes, right? We'd still have the municipal side of the property taxes. We'd also still have all the non-residential property taxes. This is just the residential slice. So we still have a significant amount of property taxes in the state. But I, I, to your question, I don't think that there's any other state that that um, bases school taxes entirely on income for residents. Okay. So know where we can look. All right, Senator Pearson. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple questions, Steph. There's no other state that has a statewide funding system right. of any kind, right, in terms of schools? Hawaii does, but they're the only other one, and it operates a little bit differently. Okay. Um, and then the, the, you said something that I hadn't heard of before, that, that doing this kind of proposal would eliminate the CLA, Common Level of Appraisal. Is that true or is that only for res? Does the CLA apply to commercial properties? Right. So because it's a town by town adjustment, it's not going to apply to the non-residential state right rate. So it's only that residential piece, right? But it but it would it still exist for valuation of commercial properties? That's what I'm trying to ask. I I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question. I'd have to look into it. It's not something I've been I see Deb Brighton nodding. So knows we'll, the we'll ask her okay. for that. The, the, the last question I have is, is sort of I'm I'm curious about the points the chairs brought up and 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 I think it's probably widely held held uh well I don't mean to speak for her, but um that it, it would be a fairly common sentiment um in this in the legislature is is this capacity question and and if we sort of make this leap, um, do we therefore limit our ability to re to to generate revenue if we have some kind of downturn or need need revenue in the future? 
Um, and and I think that's, of course, a, a very important question for us to understand. And also, we have to balance it with whether or not we, what kind of tax structure we have. Do we want a, a regressive tax structure, a progressive tax structure, or, or something in between? We have as a policy set of, of, of an admirably progressive income tax, but, um, and, and I think usually that's celebrated, but when it comes to the school tax, um, that's not the case, not at all. It's quite regressive the way, even though we've income sensitized it. And so when we, were we to make this change, could you talk about the tax burden that Vermonters are paying? Do, would this go all the way to saying our tax burden is progressive? Or does this say, after we do this with the income tax and this, but you still have the sales tax, so the tax burden would be still mixed. Or I, I'm trying to understand, you know, is this? So I'm interested in a tax, in a progressive tax system across the board. Um, I don't think it's a principle that we should apply to some of our tax burden, but not others. But I don't think, as important as I think this change is, I guess I'm curious to know what it means overall to our entire tax burden that Vermonters face. Does it get us just better? Does it get us to an entirely progressive system or, or what, what's your reaction? So I think, um, so it's a good question. So you're right in saying we have this very progressive income tax, a sales tax that's flat ends up being regressive, right? Because people have to buy a certain amount of um, goods. And, and so it, so lower income people end up paying a, a larger share in sales tax. And then the property tax is kind of bumpy because we have this income sensitivity, because we have this income-based adjustment, it's not regressive all the way through, right? So we're, we're, we're sort of already making this adjustment at the low income end, but it becomes regressive once you get past that income sensitivity piece. So this would sort of lift up that, that other side and make the whole, the sort of the higher side and make that the whole school tax piece um, progressive. So a lot, I think a lot of the work, you know, we, we work a lot with ITEP who does this sort of big who pays report by state every year. You may have seen well, it and I'm happy to send you tell them, us like, who that is. The Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy is okay. what ITEP stands for. Um, and they do a lot of this work at the state level. And every couple of years, they release this report on state taxes, but it's looking at state and local taxes combined. So I think you're still going to have sort of some of the regressivity effects of the, of the local, the local, the municipal piece of the property tax. So, but if you're just focused on the state system, I think overall, does it completely offset this the sales tax regressivity? I don't know. I'd have to look closely at sort of those numbers, but it definitely goes a long way in that direction. So, I think that was part of your question. I think there was another part of your question that um, I wanted to respond to, and I'm kind of lost it for a second there. But you could remind me if if there's. Well, something. I. I, I I think that's what I was after was was that question. So I, I'm sorry if I, I, I bumbled through my question. So maybe that's why it's confusing. No, you're fine. I did want to I think I did want to get to the, the first part, which was the part that the chair brought up was um, this question of sort of are, are we using up the capacity? And I think I come back to this question of personal income keeps growing, but it doesn't grow again, it doesn't sort of grow steadily across the income spectrum, right? It tends to be concentrated and be growing faster at the top. That's true in Vermont. It's been true in Vermont for a number of decades, really, but we've seen, you know, that sort of accelerate over the last 20 years. Um, so, so I think the question is, does your system keep up with where the money's going more than are we using up the, the burden, you know, are sort of, are we using up capacity? The question is, are we where we need to be in terms of how the system is designed? Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Senator McDonald. Madam Chair, we, we've been sort of in this uh, area of discussion three or four times already this, uh, this session. And I've asked in each one of those, these times, if JFO would bring us up to date on what percentage of Vermonters are paying their school taxes based on income. And we have yet to get a, uh, an answer back what it is, was last year, the year before, and what it's projected to be next year. Such information would be helpful in these deliberations. Okay. 
we will send that. I thought we had heard that, but um, we will take, we will ask them again. Okay, any other questions for Ms. Yu? Senator Hardy. I just wanted to respond quickly to Senator McDonald. That's in the pupil waiting task force report. Um, we've had, they've answered that question before, but you can certainly ask them again. I think it's around 78% if I remember, but I can pull it up and, out and get that. That specific. is my recollection, but any other questions? If not, I'm gonna move on to Karen Horn. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm Karen Horn with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Um, and thank you for having me this afternoon. We have supported moving from a homestead property education tax to a homestead income-based education tax for quite some time. Um, our board uh, our board endorsed both the recommendations of the pupil factor weighting report and those of the tax structure commission last year. The uh, I I did write about this for our. Uh, legislative report this week and the Public Assets Institute actually had a graphic that speaks to the issue of uh, the number of homeowners who are paying homestead income tax, homestead taxes based on income, which is two thirds versus homeowners paying based on property value, which is one third. Um, I think that's also information that's provided in the tax structure commission report. Uh, we, and uh, you're, I see that you're gonna hear from Deb Brighton uh, in a few moments. And she made a presentation to the Ways and Means Committee yesterday, which contained a lot of information about what it would look like if you actually did move entirely to income taxes for a homestead uh, education taxes. We don't think it's that much of a leap given the number of people who are already paying based on income. So, uh, and we, as I said earlier, we've supported it uh, for, for quite a few years. Uh, I think it might be a bit of a heavy lift to move there this year at the same time that you're implementing the pupil weighting factors, the new pupil weights. Um, but uh, that that's where we are. And I have relied on the analysis done by uh, the Tax Structure Commission and Deb Brighton on for my information on, on these issues for quite a few years also. There isn't anybody better than Deb Brighton to, to do that analysis. Okay, Karen, unless things have changed, um, I remember fighting the statewide property tax. Um, and unless things have changed a lot, Towns have always had a difficult time. I think the standard breakdown was two thirds of the tax money went to the schools. That may have changed, but what's the likelihood that um, towns would hold their tax rates steady? If people are used to paying, you know, a certain amount, and suddenly two thirds of that cost is taken away, what is the likelihood that the municipal governments, which I think we've said are regressive, uh, or regressive taxation would increase their spending? Well, I, I think that in, to be realistic, municipal governments likely would increase their spending somewhat. Uh, it's the only revenue source that towns have unless they have a local option tax. And I guess we don't want to talk about that today, but- um, Well, that might go away the, too. <laughs> thank, thank you for your support of local option taxes in the past. Uh, Not battle, so. Right. 
if if you look at what's happening with municipal budgets this year, uh, given the increase in costs for supplies, for um, materials, for uh, for retaining qualified personnel, uh, you, budgets are going up at the municipal level. And I, I think that's just a fact of life when you've got one revenue source. Right. And there are some towns where the municipal actually is larger than the school budget. I uh, have one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's all, it's generally speaking the cities and I don't know if it's all the cities, but because you provide those, um, a, a wide variety of services that most municipalities don't. All right. Okay, questions for Deb. I am not seeing any. Okay, I'm gonna go on to Jordan Gianconia from Vermont Business for Social Responsibility. Welcome. I don't know that you've been to the committee before. So just introduce yourself for the record and the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, and great to see y'all. I've been in front of this committee but one time and it was pre-COVID, which uh, feels like a small lifetime ago. And I think- I was, was gonna say that was Prehistory, old history, and I was on crutches back then too. So different, oh, different ball okay. game. Um, but uh, well, thanks as always. Thank you all for the opportunity to offer uh, comments on S two one two, and you know certainly appreciate the efforts of this committee and your clear recognition of just the critical role that quality education plays in creating a just, equitable, and Vermont economy. Um, so for the record, I'm Jordan Giaconia, public policy manager with Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. We are a statewide nonprofit business association with a mission to leverage the power of businesses um, for positive social and environmental change and to give you a sense of sort of a breakdown of our membership. Um, in total, we typically fluctuate between about 650 and 700 members on, on an annual basis. Um, about 35% of those employ 10 full-time employees or less, 65% employ 50 full-time employees, and about 6% employ 300 or more. Um, so for years and years, Vermont or VBSR has really held that a strong education system is essential for a strong economy. And there's a host of mechanisms, and there are very few mechanisms effective as the public education system, increasing personal and intergenerational wealth, addressing poverty and crime, um, and also equipping the future workforce with the skills and knowledge that they need to succeed. Um, so across the board, states that have made significant investments in education as a workforce development tool have much higher median family incomes, higher employee productivity, um, and also continues uh, to help create a longer term effect in terms of increasing state tax revenues through boosted wages and opportunities for workers. Um, so the, the current numbers right now on the national level, US worker with a high school diploma, they earn about $20,000 a year, which is about $10,000 less than someone who graduated high school. And then workers with bachelor's degrees earn about 55,000 a year. So increase worker earnings, grow our tax base, and as a result, um, reduce pressure on our tax rates. Um, so overall, again, maintain that a strong educational system strengthens Vermont businesses as well, trains high, highly qualified workers um, with skills that match the needs of their employers and allows our businesses to really succeed and grow and relate. And again, lead to the creation of additional high quality family sustaining jobs. So there's really a positive feedback loop there. Now, how to fund Vermont's education system adequately and fairly is a very, very difficult question, a challenging one that's been facing our state for some time. It's one where BBSR has done a host of research on um, issuing a, a 2015 white paper detailing some of our positions as it relates to our financing structure. Um, and in voting on school budgets, you know, voters and officials both will consistently reference the growing property, uh, growing burden of property taxes as their primary driver for opposing school budgets. Um, granted, we had some pretty re reasonable votes this past year and had some pretty strong turnout. Um, but again, Vermont's current financing system, funding system also pins municipalities and school systems against each other with limited funding pool and a fairly complicated tax scheme. Um, so first and foremost, I want to address the really the crux of this bill, the income versus property-based education taxes. So historically, our over-reliance on property tax means that Vermont's more rural, sparsely populated regions with disproportionately small tax bases couldn't generate the income necessary to provide residents with quality education. And of course, as you all well know, we did a lot of efforts to reduce these disparities. Um, and that ranges anywhere from, you know, creating a uh, taxing on non-homestead properties at a uniform rate, tying education to tax um, to, district, to districts for voted supported spending per pupil and adjusting education property taxes for homes with up to two acres to better reflect household income. 
So while VBSR recognizes the critical and hard fought advances that we've made in reducing disparities between Vermont school districts and in keeping our education tax from being overly regressive, property taxes just simply aren't, they're not an adequate method of funding Vermont schools. Property taxes are regressive and the burden of for paying for local schools um, largely falls on lower to middle and class middle class Vermonters. And of course, you'll hear a lot of really common themes as to what Steph has mentioned and others. Um, but ultimately, property taxes just don't reflect a household's ability to pay taxes and afford other critical goods and services. So the most uh, I'm relying on the Federal Reserve's 2017 assessment that low net worth households typically own homes that are exceed 100% of their net worth. And as Steph mentioned, um, that's largely because they don't have many other assets and they're also um, mortgaging their homes. So still have to chase down that debt. Um, for middle income families, their home typically runs about 88% of their net worth and then 25% of the net worth of higher income families. So under current Vermont law, a family making about 125,000 a year would pay roughly 3% of their total household um, or total income in homestead school taxes. Family making more than a million dollars each year pays about 0.5% of their total income taxes. And this largely mirrors national trends. Um, to give a more practical example and, and you know, recognize we now have a lot of, a lot of cost containment mechanisms and a lot of, to address disparities, but ultimately if you took those away, a taxpayer who suddenly found themselves unemployed um, wouldn't see a change in their property tax bill, even though their ability to pay has, has greatly diminished. Um, so to draw things back to look at, you know, really at the 10,000 foot level, VBSR developed uh, or held a tax and fiscal policy statement. And that really calls for a tax system that's fair, that's simple transparent, accountable, sustainable, and also competitive. Um, and we really feel that sort of this overly complex use of an amalgam of property-based and income-based taxes to fund our school system fails to meet these marks um, and the changes as proposed in S212, namely to move from a predominantly property-based tax to an income-based tax uh, would really simplify the education funding system and allow for more participation in school budgeting across the state, again, because of that simplicity. Um, want to address the non-homestead education property taxes as well. So right now, property taxes contribute to about two-thirds, or homestead property taxes, or excuse me, property taxes contribute about two-thirds of all the revenues to the state's $1.8 billion education fund. And of that, uh, the homestead tax provides, it's about a quarter of all the revenues, and non-homestead tax, um, namely those applied to homes, rentals, and commercial properties, uh, they bring in about 40%. So we strongly support retaining that non-homestead tax, especially considering Vermont, Vermont's abundance of second homeowners in the booming short-term rental market. That being said, I uh, really want to, cannot stress enough the significance of the tax credit for renters to offset the costs that will continue to be passed down to them by their landlords. We do have some concerns that these expenses in concert with a new income-based tax, education tax will create an undue burden for Vermont's renters at a time when rental prices are an all-time high. Um, so, you know, a quick stat there, the Outer Reach report from the National Low Income Housing Coalition report average Vermonter needs to earn about $24 an hour to afford a safe, decent place to live in Vermont, but the average renter makes less than $14 per hour. So that marks the sixth largest affordability gap in the nation. So we appreciate some of those cost containment measures for those who have lower um, AGIs, um, but, you know, really urge this community to consider both circuit breaker credits and more robust withholding options as well for Vermont taxpayers to ensure that these changes are not overly burdensome on renters. Um, so more of a concern than a hard stop in, or more on the hard line in that space, but just a flag. And then lastly, on the education fund volatility, um, I appreciated your comments, Madam Chair and others. So presently, our, our property-based education tax funding systems, it's, it's fairly stable and predictable. You know, we, our budget informs the property tax rate, um, required to raise the funds that we need. Um, and the property tax base is a fairly known quantity going into this process. Um, the shift to that income-based model means that there's some volatility passed on to the taxpayer, but to avoid some of the really major shifts in tax rates and to increase predictability, we would encourage you all to create a, consider creating a more robust education stabilization fund um, and other cost control mechanisms as, as recommended by the Vermont Tax Commission's most recent report. And that includes the, the creation of the Education Tax Advisory Committee to support both you know, coordination across the board, um, also accountability and transparency. So with that, I uh, wanna thank you all for the opportunity to offer comments and happy to field questions. Okay, any questions? I'm not seeing any. So thank you. And um, if, if you haven't, can you submit that white paper so we can read it? Absolutely, again? Madam Chair. I, I okay. had a hard copy. 
I had a hard copy only that I uh, that I had pulled out of our storage unit. So I was looking to either scan it or get a digital one before I got it to you. But I think I found the digital one. So I'll have that. OK, to you. good. Then we can get it up on our website and folks can read it. Sounds good. OK, now we're going to go to Deb Brighton. So, Deb, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Deb Brighton. I'm consultant to the Joint Fiscal Office. And I, what I wanted to do now was um, get back to you uh, because when we spoke before, I hadn't been able to actually run the numbers on um, S212. And I have been able to do that now, although I ran it for FY20. Um, so I'm using actual numbers. Um, but FY20. And so I wanted to give you just some of the results. And um, but before I start, I, I wanted to make sure that we are all on the same page, that basically the plan is to replace our current house site education tax and our property tax credit with a tax based on, for, on residents' adjusted gross income. And that's the only part that we're changing. Okay, we're not changing the non-residential tax or the other taxes that go into the education fund. Um, and we're also uh, maintaining the yield um, system, which is what makes us Brigham compliant now. Um, it essentially says that uh, for the same spending per pupil in any district, you would have the same tax rate. It's as if we shared the tax base. Everyone had the same tax base per pupil. We would do the same thing with the AGI. So everyone would still have the same access to the tax base that comes from the combined um, revenue sources that go into the education fund. Um, and I wonder if I can share my screen. As, uh, yes, that, I think it would be helpful to. Okay, I've got some charts for you. They're also on your website. Okay. Um, Think. I think it's easier to look at them straight in front instead of looking up and down usually. Okay. I mean, yeah. You can tell me when you see something. There it is. Okay, great. So I wanted to just start off with the very basics, which is the way we're going to set the rate. And it's the same thing that we do now. Um, basically, we take the spending per pupil, we divide by a yield, and we come up with a tax rate. And the tax rate would be a percent of adjusted gross income. And so um, it would mean that in any district, you would have access to the same uh, tax base, essentially. It wouldn't depend on the AGI of the residents in their district. It would be statewide. So I just had an example here of District A that spends $15,000 per pupil, and District B that spends 17000 per pupil. Um, in either case, you'd take the spending per pupil, divide by the yield that's set by the state, and you come up with a tax rate. Okay, so the tax rate would be higher in District A than in District B. So we keep the local control. The, district, the, the rates would vary from district to district, but they would vary depending on spending per pupil rather than depending on the AGI of the residents. So this chart is just showing you two things. About, District A and District B, um, District A spends less. And so the height of the bar, which is showing you the tax as a percent of adjusted gross income by income category, maybe I show you the household income category. Um, so you can see that uh, District A, the bars are consistently lower than the bars in District B because their spending per pupil is lower. And you can also see that in both districts, after you get to an income of $50,000, the height of the bar is the same for all income categories. In other words, no matter what your income category is, you're going to pay that percentage of your income, um, the same percentage uh, that was set for your, your whole district. For the same level of spending, right? I'm sorry, I missed that question. For the same, you pay the same percentage for the yes. same level of spending. That's right. That's so, right. Uh, if, okay. Madam Chair, 
Is it, yes, Senator is it, McDonald, you have a question. Yeah, is it, what I look at is a complicated bunch of bars and graphs, but have you essentially simply applied the same rules we used to the property tax base now under current law, have you simply applied them to the new income tax base and then allowed the math to perform the same tasks? Yes. So it's, it's just a switch of tax basis, not a whole new convoluted system that we have to relearn. It is simply a substitution of tax basis for the purpose of comprehending this. Is that, that a fair analysis? That's correct. It's based on Thank spending you. per pupil and it's sharing a tax base. It's just stripping Thank off the credits and all the caps and things like that. So it's much simpler. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So this chart is comparing the same chart that we just looked at um, with current law. So you've got the income categories across the bottom and the height of the bar is showing you the tax or the tax bill um, as a percent of income in each of those income categories. And so as you would expect, the purple line is straight. Um, and, and maybe I should point out actually, I, the first chart that I showed you was just um, conceptual. Every chart I'm gonna show you after this is based on the actual numbers that we have from FY20. So it's actual people with their mix of um, house value and income. And the categories at the bottom are household income as we currently know it. And we'd be shifting not from household income, but to AGI. So there is a difference in the way we're measuring income. And they, they track pretty closely, but there's some um, definite glitches. <laughs> But anyway, what you notice here is that the purple line is pretty much straight across that because as we said before, um, you're paying the same, everyone's paying the same percentage of their income in each district. And when you multiply it or bring it up to the state as a whole, you pretty much get a straight line. But because there is a variation between districts, um, if you find more high spending districts in one income category than another, you might say a little, see a little blip. So, but the height of the red bar is current law. And so you can see that it's higher in certain income categories, um, but it's definitely not an even percentage of income. Okay, okay. Deb, yes. I've got a couple questions, I guess. If I am a very wealthy person and I am living in a low spending town, am I going to pay the same percentage of my income as the wealthy person living in the next town that is low spending? Or am I just paying a statewide flat rate that's equalized? No, you're paying your town's rate. Okay. okay. So if the town next door, if you were paying $15,000, if your town were spending $15,000 um, per pupil and the next town was, you'd be paying the same rate, no matter what town you were in. Okay, but it, it, is, it does fluctuate. It fluctuates, um, yes. So town, all right. Um, I'm trying to figure out why towns with a lot of rich people wouldn't find it easier to spend more. But the one thing that's missing on your chart, I see the percentage of your income, but what's the dollar change there? Okay. I mean, to say that that's a pretty big, how much more? And again, I'm going to ask you the same thing about the taxing capacity. How did you figure out how much we can tax certain groups before they revolt? And we spent the last Blue Ribbon Tax Commission being very focused on our top marginal rate because that was, it was the one that showed up in every national study 
and made us the highest income or second highest income tax in the country. So what's this going to do to that top marginal rate we've been trying to get down? Okay, I can't answer all of your questions. Okay. But I can show you as far as I've gotten in terms of modeling what would happen. Then, then we have to dig deeper into what this means in the bigger picture. Um, but this is showing you, this is, so the other charts that, you know, had that straight line, that was as a percentage of income. And I think this is getting to Senator Cummings' question about what's the difference in the bill. The chart looks quite different. And this is showing you that the purple lines are showing you that under the resident education tax, the bill would go up um, because it's a percentage of income. And as the income goes up, 2.5% of the income goes up as well. So the bill goes up. And the red bar is showing you the actual bills. Um, so you can see they're significantly higher at the high end. And this, this red bar jumping up here is just actual data, the actual people that ended up in that category. It's nothing structural about our current system. Okay, so right now somebody that's paying looks like six or seven thousand dollars in, which is pretty low. I'm paying a lot more than that. What town are they getting away with? <laughs> um, but they're paying somewhere a little bit, maybe eight, but less than 10,000, they're going to be paying about 25,000 in property tax. So the property tax is going so to in this category, almost yeah. triple. Yeah. Well, it, it wouldn't be in property tax, it'd be in school tax. It That's would be, it would be an income tax, whatever the, the education tax. They're going yeah. to be paying three times as much next year as this year, right? Yes. Or, or at least more than twice. Yep. Okay. All right. So can, can um, I just ask Deb quickly before you go away yeah. from that from that chart? Um, it, it, I'm I'm intrigued, and this comes back to what I asked Steph earlier. This is this is a flat tax. So while it has a it has a straight line, I guess you would say, but that's not what we think of as a progressive tax structure, yeah. right? And can you just talk quickly about the difference there? Uh, you know, for instance, I don't know if you have it yet, but but the same structure here with our income tax um, overlay would be would be maybe interesting oh. or surprise people. Yeah, Massachusetts has a flat tax for income. What do they do for school taxes? Madam Chair, would it be all right if she answered my question first? Oh, yeah, I didn't know you answered one. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I really don't know the answer, um, except that we did talk about, on the Tax Structure Commission, we spent a lot of time talking about should, should this tax be progressive as well? Um, and I decided partly for simplicity, and partly because of the change to just keep it as a flat percentage of adjusted gross income rather than to make it progressive. Um, and that also helps with volatility issues. So the next step, I think, um, one of the things that we were frustrated with is the same question that you asked earlier, and that is um, the tax incidence. Uh, figuring out, compiling everything and trying to figure out by income category with all the different taxes, where are we um, in terms of the different income categories? And I think that will help us understand whether the system is progressive or not, and also what the capacity is um, in the different income categories. But at this point, we don't have that collected. So that's sort of our next step. Um, and one of the recommendations that we made about setting up this education um, finance advisory committee, ongoing committee, is to be able to take, take a look at this sort of stuff, the um, combinations and where the school tax fits in because it's such a huge tax and 
keep us up to date on that. Um, I think that as ability to pay changes over time, we want to keep up with it. I think that's sort of what Stephanie was saying. We want to make sure that our tax structure is keeping up with it. Sometimes it wouldn't automatically, but sometimes we need to make other changes too. And we don't catch it because we don't, we're not measuring this in any ongoing way. So I can't really answer your question, but I want to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Deb. All right. Um, Deb, so, you just totally lost me. Yeah. What aren't we measuring or can't we measure now? Okay. So what would be nice to answer your questions and to answer Senator Pearson's questions would be to compile the incidents by income category of all our taxes, okay? okay. And it's, it's not just taxes, it's also, our, our tax structure is taking taxes and it's also giving, um, giving revenue back. Right. So looking at those in steps, you know, where we're taking the taxes from, where it's going back to, and where we end up. Um, but right now, we don't have that. And so it'd be nice to do it once and then to do it periodically so we could see what's changing. Okay, and you've chosen an outside committee rather than joint fiscal working with tax and ed to do that? Um, well, we wanted, we definitely wanted an education finance committee so that more people were working on the education finance issues. Um, the Tax Structure Commission didn't say who should do the incidence study. That was sort of a separate recommendation. Okay, because I think we've got three people working on it and joint fiscal right now, working on uh, school taxing. So that may be something we need to work out. Okay. Okay. You're on um, the next graph. So that this next chart is just showing a little bit more detail on the um, people in the lower income ranges where the, where the lines start to diverge. Um, the purple line is the residential education tax that we're proposing. The red line is current law and the income categories across the bottom. And the line goes up according to what the median tax bill is in each of those income categories. And so you can see at the very low end, the um, residential tax bill that we're go planning to go to would be result in a lower bill up to about somewhere around 40 or 50,000 income. Then they're roughly the same. And this going up here, um, the red line is much higher um, over 90,000 because there's that house site cap at 90,000. So we have this suddenly at 90,000 people are paying a higher percentage of their income than at lower incomes or at higher incomes um, under current law. And then the, the purple line, the residential education tax continues pretty much as a straight line, but somewhere around, this was between 200 and, uh, 225,000 in FY20, they diverge. And at that point, that's when it starts to get higher. Um, if you go to the residential income tax. Um, so uh, the next chart is just sort of layering on th the questions. We get a lot of questions about, are we paying our fair share or are we just shifting everything to wealthy people? And what are people paying? Who's paying their share? And so this is just showing you the share of total taxpayers we have per income category. So you can see that the bulk 40% of our taxpayers, and this is just, again, um, homeowners, okay? Mm -hmm. So about 40% of them are in the 50 to $100,000 um, income category. And there are very few up in the higher income categories. And so then if you did the same idea, but instead of looking at the share of households um, in each category, you're looking at the share of the total taxes that are being raised, the height of the bar is showing you what share of total house site education taxes are being raised in each income category. 
And so the red bar, again, is current law. The purple bar is um, going to income. So you see that that same income category that had the most filers is definitely um, paying a high share, high proportion of the total taxes raised. Um, yeah. The other thing to notice is that, that at the very high end, the, um, the residential, the income version that we're going to, the residential yeah. tax would be a lot higher than current law. Deb, Deb um, not to put too fine a point on it, but, but this is what we're looking at here proves the slogan, I guess, that this is a strategy to offer middle-class tax relief, right? I mean, this is the people between 50 and 150 are, are seeing a significant I just want to make sure that's what I'm looking at, but it's they're they're seeing uh, the benefit in that sense, and and the people yeah. at the very high end are furnishing that benefit. Yes, yeah. So the, the next chart sort of compares the two, those overlays the two charts. So you can see that, I think, um, and that the gray bars are showing you where the people are, the share of households. And then the lines are showing you the percent of education tax that each group would pay. Okay, so the red line is under current law and then the blue line is under the income. And so what happens is you get a drop in the percentage in, in this category, um, the 5,200 income category, you see a drop. Um, and then you definitely see an increase over here where you have um, less than 1% of the, of the filers are in this category and they pay 8.6% of the um, education taxes under the residential education rate. That's the, that's the biggest difference, okay? Um, and this is another way though to look at the shares. And so this is showing you the shares of taxes raised again, but by the share of adjusted gross income. Uh, compared, right. by, uh, compared by income. Yeah. yeah, so the gray bar is showing you how much of the state's total um, household adjusted gross income is in each income category. And you see again, that a high amount of it, because there are a whole lot of filers, not because they have high AGI necessarily, but a whole lot of it is in the 5,200,000 income category. Uh, and then you also see there's a big jump up here in the category of over a million. And you can also see that the purple line, which is the share that would be raised by the resident education tax, tracks this perfectly because that's what we're doing. Because it reflects your ability to pay. That's right. Yeah, okay. Huh. Okay, that, that is the purpose. And, you know, I've, um, this next one shows basically the same chart, but it also shows you where, where we are, the red line being current law. So you can see the same differences that you saw before. It doesn't track um, where the AGI is as well as the way we would be going to. So it's not a huge change that we're making, um, but you can see where the differences are. Okay. Um, I, there is a table there that I don't want to go through, um, but it shows you where, in which income categories, how many people would see an increase and how many people would see a decrease in their tax bill. And I, I've decided after dealing with this so many times that, uh, we look at that and we focus way too much on the change from where we are now and instead of focusing on where we're trying to get to and whether it's fair. So um, you're welcome to look at it. You've got it up on the website, but in the interest of time, I wanted to spend a little bit more time on where we're trying to get to. Um, and so this last chart is just showing you a town and um, this is a real town. And 
there are people in higher income categories, but I'm not allowed to show uh, data for small numbers of people for confidentiality purposes. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because the change, some people ask where the big change is gonna be, what towns are gonna be winners and what towns are gonna be losers. And essentially it's not a um, town by town change. It's not a district by district change. As Senator McDonald said, we're doing the same thing as we did before. Um, we're setting our rate exactly the same way. So a high spending district will be still be a high spending district and a low spending district will still be a low spending district. Um, and so that, that won't change. But what does change is within a district, um, the bills will depend on people's, uh, the relationship, well, it will, it'll be based now on their adjusted gross income. And so it will change based on the relationship between their income and their house value. Okay, because that's what they were paying on before. They were paying on some combination of income and house value. And so in this town, which is Middlebury, um, you can see that where the purple bar is lower, that's the income category where they, the bill would drop slightly. And where the purple bar is higher, in that income category, where the bill would go up. Okay, so it's um, not going to change things in terms of what's a high tax district and what's a low tax district. We're still basing that the same way. It's just shifting it around. Um, Here, may I ask you a question? Senator Brock, head on Thank mute. Uh, I can see. <clears throat> excuse me, that in this particular case, if you move over to the right side of the chart, there's some people who it looks like would effectively have their taxes doubled uh, during the course of the year. Uh, others, you know, the change is, is much more modest, but it's much more obvious at the, at the large end. In terms of tax reductions, though, it is, it is less significant, again, until you get to the, uh, the very high end. The question that I've got is, as you look at the very, very, very wealthy people in Vermont who probably aren't on your chart, the person who has 20 million or 30 million a year, you know, huge amounts of income, uh, their taxes would go up exponentially. And is there any thought as to whether or not that might have an out migration uh, impact on those higher end taxpayers? Uh, each one of whom who leaves would have a disproportionate impact on the rest of the system. Right, it's, it's a kind of question that I really can't answer. Um, and, you know, I think that it's, um, one of the things that we've thought about is just trying to figure out uh, what the combined tax burden is on different incomes, particularly on high incomes now, how that compares with other states. But in terms of <laughs> at what point it's too much or whatever, I don't, exactly know how to get at. But it's definitely well, the next are, step to look say, at. $30 million a year, uh, and you took a 2.5%, you've, you've got, what, $750,000 in taxes, whereas if they had a very expensive home uh, under the system we have right now, they may pay $20,000, $30,000 at the most. Yeah. That, that's a big, and you know, is, are there any studies as to what motivates out migration among the wealthy? It's a good question. I can't answer it. Um, I'm gonna to try to dive into it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, if I could just sort of finish up on, on the things that you don't really see in this chart um, about where we're going is um, that what this also does is it makes it very simple and very direct so that when people go to school meeting to vote in the budget, 
they would know um, they're in the process of preparing their income tax. They know what their income was um, for say 2021. They could would therefore know what like a 2.5% rate, if that's what they're voting in, would do to them. There would be no uh, pay one tax first and get a, a, um, a credit in the next year. So it would be pretty clear and pretty direct. Um, I think also we would start thinking of this tax as what you should pay. And right now, what we're doing with this combination of property tax and education tax is we're sort of looking at property tax is the right thing. And this education credit is like a subsidy. Um, and so it's, it's shifting our thinking, I think, to saying um, this, uh, we wanna make sure that our tax is fair. And this is what our tax is, not what the subsidy is. Um, and I, I think basically it's an attempt to move to the ability to pay. Okay, Deb, couple yes. questions. Um, I lost my train of thought on one of them, but um, we've always tried to limit major impacts on your tax bill. We do most things in three to five year. I think we're looking at waiting in five year increments. Uh, to go from 30,000 to 750 is more than a 3% jump. Um, have, have we thought about how we're going to phase this in? Uh, no, haven't gotten to that yet. Okay. And, and we haven't done the, the research on the total tax burden, right? When we look at different categories. All right. right. And those are things we probably should know. Definitely. Um, how does Massachusetts that has a flat tax on income, how does it fund its schools? Do you know? I don't know. All I'll right. check. Pearson. Thanks. Um, Deb, I think it's just worth saying, I, I know the answer, but what we're talking about eliminates homeowners property tax for school tax, right? I mean, it, it's, it, we've been talking about what it means to income taxpayers, but it, what it means to homeowners is they no longer get a property tax bill that has their eyes popping. Um, other than municipalities, as we heard, um, may react to that, having having had many years of sort of stagnant income. Um, what you, I think it was you uh, said that people would be able to, maybe it was Steph, Stephanie, that people would be able to pay this over time. And there are some towns where your property tax bill is due once a year. Most towns, I think, are four times a year. Can you just talk about mechanically, have we envisioned this as part of the withholding? Um, and is that complicated because the business has to figure out where you live or would there be a, you know, a, a placeholder withholding and then it would get trued up? Can you just talk about some of those mechanics, please? Um, well, right now, the, the way the bill is written, it's assumed that it would be withholding if that's what you have or estimated payments if that's what you do. Um, but other people have said it may be better to just have, um, to keep it separate from the personal income tax and to have four installments or five installments uh, closer to what some towns have done for property taxes. And part of the reason for that is, as you said, um, we're shifting, we're, we're talking about this as a tax based on income, but we're re totally replacing your property tax paid on your homestead. And so in a sense, we don't want it to get confused with the income tax. We have a personal income tax and we're calling this the residential education tax. And so maybe it should be kept separate 
also in terms of uh, the withholding or the estimated payments. But the idea is just basically to not have that one lump sum payment. Okay. And what, what does it do? There's, there's a plenty of people that fill out their taxes and get a, get a refund because maybe the, the earned income tax credit um, or other things. How does this fit on top of that and, and some of those existing structures in our income tax? Yeah, it, it could be similar. I mean, basically, if you pay in, particularly if you, the way it's uh, written now is, is that there would be withholding and it would just, you'd have like three choices of, of um, you know, percentages and there wouldn't be any penalty if you chose the wrong one, but uh, you'd reconcile at the end. So you might get a credit if you chose a high withholding amount. Um, so it could be done that way. I guess what I mean is, is um, you know, it's ironic, but, but there are tens of thousands of Vermonters who are quite eager to fill out their taxes every year because they get a refund yeah. because of our refundable tax credits. I want to make sure that I'm right. I don't oh. believe this this there's no getting refunded out of this one like this is a hard obligation that the earned income tax credit might might work against but but there's no um right in other words somebody that today gets gets a refund and effect or or it would seem like their tax bill is zero in april there's no way they still get zero they're gonna have to pay this what did you call it the, the under this scheme they're they're right. going to have a bill right right so that's a good point um it would be independent of it's not going to lower your earned income tax credit um you know it's, it's not going to change any of that you have to pay this bill okay and then the other question i have because it's another complexity that we have is and and I might, when I first started talking about this, I stood with Bud Otterman and, and Joy Donovan, and which, which dates me because Bud Otterman's been in the ground for a while. May he rest in peace. And he, he was a, a, a principled, bullish conservative. I liked working with him. But uh, he was from Topsham, I think. And, and he liked this because it had a real impact on rural communities. And that had to do something I not sure I could explain with the home site and two acre kind of division. Is that, can, can you, can you, am I right to still be grounded in there? And I guess really the question is what does this do for rural communities where, um, you know, you're, you're, you have a lot of acres in your home, in, in, on your lot. And I think we treat different parts of that acres and maybe it's only for folks in current use, but can you can you walk me through that? Because there are implications for rural communities that we should understand. Yeah, I would say rural communities, if you have 10 acres or something, um, it's, it's not as helpful because um, this only affects your house in two acres, okay? And the current use program won't pick up that until you have 25 more acres. So you have to have a house in 27 acres before you can get into current use. So we've got that odd um, bubble in there where um, you're, so if you had a house and 17 acres, um, the house and two acres, would you'd switch and pay on the income. But the 15 acres would be subject to the tax, the non-homestead tax. Okay, that, that's all there would be. There wouldn't be a homestead property rate the way we have it now. So it would, it would be as if it were non-homestead. Um, the, but it is true that the um, listers are directed now to value the two acres around your house as sort of a separate house and two acre lot. So. You, the, the 15 extra acres would be low value. That hasn't always been true. And so, 
Am I hearing you say that wouldn't be, there's not a big difference to what it means if depending on the size of your lot or if you live in a town or, or, or a city, it, it, you're just, you're just getting this applied to your income. Yeah. I mean, the, the difference is if you have those extra acres and you're not in current use, you would have to pay the non homestead tax on that. If you were in town and you only had a house and two acres, you wouldn't have that extra acreage to pay anything on. Okay, so a rural person of low income would pay on their income for the first two acres. But if they owned 20 acres, they were going to pay the the non-residential property tax, local property tax on that additional 20 acres. So that Virtually, would virtually be the, the same as it is today. That's yeah. correct. Except that they, there's a, I think it's guaranteed that the local resident property tax will go up because I don't know a community that if they could get any tax flexibility doesn't have really good things they could use it on. So Deb, we're getting our next group in, but um, when you, I remembered what I wanted to, to ask if when you figured the overall tax kind of burden on different groups, um, part of the Trump tax credits was, um, and I think we're trying to find a war way around it, but two people, you know, a couple household that works for salaries and you get two advanced practice nurses, a doctor and an advanced practice nurse, and they own a nice house. They can't deduct those credits from their federal tax anymore. So if we are in fact raising your tax bill 750,000 for one person. Um, that's also 70, 750,000 that can't be deducted from your federal taxes. So it is something of a, it, it's a double hit there. Um, and we, you know, just when we're figuring that, uh, figure out that impact. That's okay. a good point. And Pearson, one last one, cause I've got my Thank next. I know we've only got one minute. Deb, are there, could you just tell us what pieces do we still need to work out here if we if we want to advance this? Because I know we're late, but I'd, I'd love to give it a shot. In the bill, you mean? Yeah, to, to, okay. to really enact this. And we need something around a phase-in period. You know, I believe we need to figure out some of the mechanics for renters. Um, so I'm looking for, and you can, you can answer me offline if you want, okay. but, um, that, that, that is important. Um, if we, if we're going to have a prayer here. All right. I'll give you, uh, I need, I'll give you a I need offline. to have a lot more information on the total tax burden. Um, Madam chair, on, I've been asking to work on this since, since early January. Uh, Yes, and we've been waiting on it since early January, and I have been asking for it. Senator Bray. Well, I, I know we're short on time and we're moving on, but I just wanted to speak up in support of it because I think um, there's a lot of merit and um, it seems like at heart, it tries to come back at a definition of fairness that I think many people, uh, uh, share. Yeah. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. Okay. All right.